I get so angry at people who are giving parents false information. They're, they're telling parents lies because it benefits them. They're telling parents, oh, your kid needs to play one sport. Your kid needs to specialize. You know, if your kid doesn't do this, he'll get left behind. And I'm looking at this saying, that is not true. This is your host, Coach Dwayne Carlisle, and you're listening to the Pursuit of Excellence podcast. This episode titled, The Essentials of Developing Youth Athletes with Mike Boyle is brought to you by Carlisle Performance Systems, located in San Jose, California, the place where even the best athletes are made better. I need a quick favor before we dive in. If you're digging this podcast, and I hope you are, please subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. It takes just a couple minutes, and it means a ton to us. I'm a feedback fanatic, and I would love to get your comments about the show. Please feel free to reach out to me on social media at Coach Dwayne Carlisle on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook to post your questions for upcoming topics and or just share winning strategies that's work for you so others can benefit from your approach. I'd love to hear from you. Okay, on to the show. Our guest is none other than the world-renowned strength and conditioning expert, Mike Boyle. He is the owner of Mike Boyle Strength and Conditioning in Boston, former strength coach for the Boston Red Sox, they won a World Series when he was there, former Boston Bruins and Boston University strength and conditioning coach, best-selling author, sought-after speaker, and loving husband and father, mentor to many. He has more strength and conditioning coaches under his tutelage that are in the NFL, professional sports, NCAA, high school, than anybody in the country. Most of all, he was my first strength and conditioning coach at Boston University and had a phenomenal impact on my career. We dive into several topics, including multi-sport versus a single sport athlete, when you should start training, what you should do when you start training, how parents can best support their kids. I even asked Mike what he would do differently if he were training me now compared to when he trained me then. His answer was absolutely insightful. Without further ado, the man, the myth, the legend, Mike Boyle. How you doing, Mike? I'm doing great, Dwayne. How are you? Man, I'll tell you what. This is this is a blessing to have you on the show. As you know, I'm just getting started with this, and, and to have to have you on here, I, I couldn't ask for a better guest. How's things out in Mass? My you know that we go we go way back. Yeah. Hey, Mike, you don't have to reveal ages here. When we were at, when we were at the CSCCA conference, you threw my age out there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I throw mine out there all the time, so I might as well throw yours out. <laughs> right. Yeah. Keep it in perspective. All right. What's your first memory of Dwayne Carlisle? Coming down those back stairs into uh, the weight room. I don't know if I. I don't know. You you told me that Mark brought you. I don't remember. I just remember everybody came in that back door, uh, you know, down because we were under the pool, and uh, and I just remember this kind of tall, lanky kid coming <laughs> in and thinking. Uh, I remember thinking he could use the weight room. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. But Mark saying that hey, this kid can really jump, but he needs he needs this. That's my memory. And. You know, it's so interesting from, from my perspective. I remember Mark taking me down there. And by the way, Mark was the sprint and jump coach at Boston University. He was from Russia, studied at Leningrad Institute, one of the most unheralded and underrated coaches in the country, period. He's a massage therapist by trade and, and coach. And the guy, was he was unbelievable. So he brings me down to see Mike. I'm a freshman, I'm 17 years old. As Mike said, no experience in the weight room. He brings it down. I'm like, oh my goodness, this guy's getting ready to have me lift weights. I was one of those guys that that wasn't into it per se. And I go down and I meet Mike, and he immediately put me at ease and put me in a group. You could take it from here, Mike, with with the two guys who I train with. Yeah, with B Billy and Calvin Hall. So you ended up. I mean, it's really interesting because I tell people this story all the time. Who, when you start in the field. I think you feel like this is going to happen to you all the time. And then it doesn't happen again, maybe for 20 years in terms of you get some really special guys. And I've had that experience 
with assistants. You get kind of that first assistant who's great, and you think, oh, these people are just going to kind of fall out of, you know, fall out of the trees, and they're going to land on me. And every time I turn around, there'd be another one. And then you think, man, it's tough to find another Jeff Oliver. It's tough to find, you know. So it was like, you know, I had you and Billy and Calvin, and um, and I didn't know. It, I didn't know what I didn't know. I was probably like you guys. I mean, that's what I said when I joke about your age. I wasn't that much older than you guys were. You were 17. I was probably <laughs> 27, 26. I don't even know how old I was, but I wasn't that much older. And I didn't really have a whole lot of experience. I was just at, I mean, I was just scratching the surface of what I thought I knew. And suddenly it wasn't powerlifters anymore. It wasn't football linemen anymore. It was like, okay, this, you know, Billy was a wide receiver. Calvin was a defensive back. You were a long jump, triple jump guy. And, and it was like, it was great for me because I always say, that stuff made me learn. I was forced, if I wanted to be good, I had to learn and I had to learn really fast because people, I mean, at that time, like I said, guys like Mark, you know, coaches were bringing guys in and saying, hey, can you help this guy? Can you help this guy? Because I guess in the beginning, luckily I was way, I was far ahead of everybody else, probably more by accident just because there was not too many people to be far ahead of. It's like, if you're in a two or three person race, it's easy to end up in the top three. <laughs> and so I was just lucky. I mean, and so I always say it to people, I was like, oh, it's not luck. And sometimes it is luck. And, you know, we started training and we were, luckily we were doing the right things. I had been lucky. People don't realize. And again, luck. Mike Wojcik was my dorm director. You know, I walk into Springfield College in 1977 and I'm like you, I'm 17 years old. And the guy standing at the door is this big guy who looks like a football player. Yeah. And then I find out that he's the field event coach. He's the shot put discus or whatever, you know, hammer coach at Springfield College. He's a graduate assistant. He's going to coach the field event guys. And I'm at that time, I'm in, just getting into lifting and maybe getting into it like in a big way in terms of, hey, I realize this is really important. If I'm ever going to get anywhere at that time, I still got the kind of wannabe football mentality in my mind. And I start hanging around this guy and realizing, hey, this guy, you know, one, he's got, he's pretty smart. He's got a pretty good handle on things. And two, he's got every muscle and fitness, every strength and health, and every Ironman magazine cataloged in boxes in his room. Yeah. I think they were milk crates, I forget. You know, they might even have been the wooden kind of uh, crates that you got with produce in them. I don't know. But he he had all that stuff in his room, and I just start pouring through that stuff. And again, when I'm at that point, I don't realize that Mike Wojcik is going to become the longest tenured guy in the National Football League. Right. I don't realize that Mike Wojcik is going to have more Super Bowl rings than Tom Brady. I don't know any of this stuff is going on. I only know that I've kind of, I've stumbled on a kindred spirit. I've stumbled on somebody who's got interests like I do. And, you know, fast forward, whatever, five years, six years later when I'm at BU, it's kind of the same thing. I stumble into guys like you and Billy and Calvin Hall and, and so, it, you know, it's just, you just sort of keep stumbling along and, and hoping that, I guess, keeping, thinking that you're going to find the right way. And the good thing, and I always said, one of the things I've been good at, maybe better than most, is being able to find those people and being able to filter information. I can remember going to the NSCA conventions very early on and thinking, realizing that Don Chu really knew what he was talking about. And Vern Gambetta really knew what he was talking about. And uh, Brett McFarlane really knew what he was talking about. Yeah. They were all track guys. I didn't find too many football strength coaches who I thought knew what they were talking about. Right. But I found some track guys. I felt like the football guys, I'm like, shit, I know more than them. I know enough about powerlifting as it is right now. I can get somebody strong. That's not that hard. But making that strength relatable and making really the idea that I had to make you a better athlete. You know, It wasn't like you didn't come to me and say, hey, Mike, I want to win a powerlifting meet. You were in there saying, I want to I want to jump X distance. You know, Billy was like, I want to be a wide receiver in the right. NFL. Calvin, I want to be a defensive back in the NFL. And so I think I knew right away that it wasn't going to just be all about max strength. And I mean, we did. We definitely, it was like we lifted weights. It wasn't yeah. like we weren't lifting weights. But I think we were doing it for that point in time, we were probably super progressive in terms of what we were doing relative to what everybody else was doing oh, in yeah. terms of you know, we weren't we didn't have machines we weren't using them we were doing single leg stuff we were doing single leg stuff when nobody was doing i mean people give me a hard time about single leg stuff now we're talking this was almost 40 years ago oh ho 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 right? oh yay hey, no, i don't hey, i don't hey. for you kid, but, uh, <laughs> okay so now on that note i 
contrary to mo what most people think, because I ended up being known for being a speed guy per se. I wasn't fast when I got to college. If I was fast, I would have won the state meet. I got a full scholarship because Mark Rayblatt talent ID'd me at a track meet when I didn't win. And he said, he goes, you're really explosive. You move your legs really fast. You can be faster. And he told me the day when he came up to me, I couldn't understand his broken Russian accent. He said, you can win IC4A championships. You can win, right? I'm like, what is this guy talking about? Well, lo and behold, I get the scholarly, come down, start working with you and him. And I improved five feet in the triple jump. I improved three and a half feet in the long jump. My sprint times come down. And personally, that was an experiential experience, experiential opportunity for me where I, I actually lived it, breathed it, and I saw the results. Here's my question for you, Mike Boyle. The things that we did back in the day where I was able to achieve that quantum improvement, knowing what you know now and knowing being someone who's always evolving in their approach, what, what would you have done differently with me? And do you think it would have impacted the results that I got at that time? Um, I think probably what I, one thing I would have done differently is I probably would have watched a lot more track practice. I think at that time I was so overwhelmed with what I was doing in terms of, I was trying to do football, basketball, oh, hockey, yeah. field hockey. I don't, I mean, I was the lone strength coach and everybody was all over it at that point. Yep. So I had no idea what else you were doing. I yep. had no idea what your plyos looked like. I had no idea what your sprint workouts looked like, really. Like, I'd talk to Mark, but I think that's probably the one thing I would have done is I said, man, I got to wander over to the track here and, and really watch a couple of these practices and figure out what the heck is going on. But, uh, and I think obviously, you know, we were, you know, I probably had you doing heavy back squats then, which I'm not a fan of right now. There were things that, that, but if you take heavy back squat out, there's not that much that we did at that time that I wouldn't do right now mm. in terms of, you know, we cleaned, we've always cleaned from the hang. We always had blocks and had clean from the hang. Yep. We always made everybody do upper body. I, I don't even know at that time. I probably hadn't even read Charlie Francis training system at that point in time yet. And, but I, I just, I always kind of had this feeling that being strong was never going to hurt anybody. And that was a hard sell because I said, you get a guy like you coming in and thinking, no, 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 man, I'm a sprinter. I'm a jumper. I don't need this. Right. And the good thing was I had Billy who was fast yeah. and, and could jump and was athletic and was all in on getting bigger and stronger. And everybody kind of looked at Billy and this Billy Brooks, for those who don't know, Billy played, I don't know, God, 10, 12, 14 years for the, you know, Indianapolis Colts, I think for the bills ended up with director of community relations for the uh, Colts for a while. But he had a really, really good career as a one double A guy, as a guy who really was not a high draft pick. He was the guy who I get credit for inventing combine training. There's a book called The Draft where this guy, Pete Williams, says that I invented training for the NFL combine. And I might have, I, but I did it because of Billy, because I was like, right. this guy's going to the combine and we need to figure out, you know, we got to make a great impression because Boston University then, we were what they called one double A football, which was, I mean, really. Division two was division two, but the reality was one double A was division two. You know, you had one A and then you had one double A. I don't know why they had the classifications that right, they right. did, but it was the it was the next level down, not the next level up. So you you're looking at that. And and we had to we had to figure things out. The good thing was we weren't we were kind of at an advantage. We had a strength coach at Boston University before BC had a strength coach. Yeah. And they had they had one A football yeah. without a strength coach. And there were a lot of schools at that point in time. I mean, I had guys coming from all over the country to train for the combine because it just was different. I mean, I think, and this is where sometimes I feel like I'm always giving people a history lesson. People have no idea. When I started doing this, there was no job to get. So when Mike Wojcik left Springfield College, and I remember this distinctly, he got a job at Syracuse and he was the part-time football strength coach yep. and the part-time field event coach. Dick McPherson was progressive at that time and, you know, wanted a strength coach. He couldn't get a full-time strength coach at that time at Syracuse. And so he got a part-time position where the guy was going to, you know, do the track field event stuff. Rusty Jones, who's also back in the NFL right now in Indianapolis, was a GA football coach at the same time that I was there. 
And Rusty got a job, and this people, I mean, talk about history, Pittsburgh Maulers in the USFL. Wow. And the Pittsburgh yeah. Penguins. Both teams then were owned by the DiBartolo family that owned the 49ers. And the same thing, they hired Rusty to be the strength coach for both teams. So at that time, I didn't know anybody who had a full-time strength and conditioning job. And I went to Boston University. You may not even remember. You probably won't remember because I don't even know if you were there my first year. But I was an athletic trainer. I was in the training room from January through um, whatever, May or June that year. And then I just realized this isn't for me. And I quit. And I walked across the street or across the hallway into this little 600-square-foot weight room that we had at that time. Yep. And was kind of like, you know, stuck my flag in the ground and said, hey, I'm the strength coach. Here I am. I'm going to, I'm taking over. Right, right. And everybody at the school kind of looked around at me like, what the hell are you doing? You just gave up a full time job. You gave up a paying position to hang out across the hall for free. And I think they thought I was so stupid that they just (laughs) didn't ask me to leave. It was kind of like, well, we can't ask the guy to leave. We're not paying him. He's just in there hanging around by himself. But suddenly at that time, Rick Pitino was a basketball coach. Yep. And, he wanted strength and conditioning. You know, he was into it. His guys were going to be in shape. He left immediately. Almost as soon as I got in the weight room, he was gone to Providence. But John Custer took over, and he knew yep. that he wanted strength and conditioning. It's funny. I always say to people, in the space of four years at BU, I worked with Rick Pitino briefly, then Custer, and then um, Steve Clifford, all who ended up being NBA coaches. Yeah, yeah. In you know, And then I said, Brett Brown was there. He was our point guard. He's now the 76ers coach. And then later on in your time, when they got a bit, a little bit later, um, Dredrick Irving, you know, ended up being our all-time leading yeah. scorer. And people would go, "Who's Dredrick Irving?" Dredrick Irving ha- you have to have a famous son, who Kyrie Irving. Yeah. And I would say to people, "I coached Kyrie Irving's father," and they kind of look at me like, "Yeah." What? With, with that, with the high top kid and play fade, oh, remember yeah, that? Play, absolutely. That thing was like it, he was six three, made him like six eleven. How yeah, about how straight up the, straight up the sides? Yeah. Had about six inches going. Hey, how about this, Mike? I was in New York at a basketball tournament. My son was in sixth grade, my oldest, Amir, and Kyrie was in, I think Kyrie's went, oh, my son was playing up. They were both in sixth grade. And this kid was wearing my son out. I'm sitting up in the stands like, oh my goodness, man. I need to get my son some, I need to get some basketball skill development. (laughs) And at halftime, guy comes up to me, puts his hands on my shoulder, was like, DC. What's up, man? It's Kyrie's dad, Dre. And I should have known, man. I should have known that that kid was going to be special. But look, we had, during that time, we had the Teague, Sean Teague, and his yeah. sons, yeah. J- Jeff Teague, NBA players. Yep. We had uh, the Sloan, what's her name? Uh, Sloan's. Sybil Smith. Sybil's, yes. Sybil Smith, who's a swimmer, whose daughter is Sloan Stevens, yeah. who won the U.S. Open last year. I mean, people don't, they have no idea that. Well, that's it's funny because I'm sitting here watching TV last last year, whenever the U.S. Open was, I'm yeah. watching with my wife, and Sloane Stevens starts talking about her mom and what a great job her mom did with her after her dad passed, and boy, going on and on and on. And then I see the mom, and I'm like, wait a second, that's so stupid. <laughs> and then it dawns on me that she had married John Stevens, who was a running back for the Patriots, yeah. who had then been killed in a car accident mm-hmm. shortly thereafter. But here's the girl winning the U S open. And it's like you said, the same, you know, it all kind of, it all goes back to the BU in the (laughs) eighties. Right. Right. And one thing I want to share with you, and I I hope that I've intimated this to you at some point in the past, you set the campus on fire. You made the weight room a very popular place to be for us student athletes. You paved the way for someone like myself from not only as a student athlete, but then I, I ended up transferring to Maryland after my sophomore year, coming back and helping you with elite strength and conditioning consultants, the company you had founded right there at BU. And you've done, you've added so much to the profession. And one of the things I want to segue into is talking about youth sports. And I think that was great for us to talk about some of the accomplished BU athletes and their kids, you having a daughter who was just on the Nash NCAA championship winning ice hockey, women's ice hockey team, Michaela, and a son, Mark, who's a budding athlete. You produced a video on youth sports. What inspires you to do that? I think it, the experience of this, because it's one thing, and you've been through it yourself because your kids play at a high level too. And I think it's easy to talk about something 
And it's a lot easier when you really don't know shit about it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of people do. And it's very difficult when suddenly you think, wow, I, I did this. I got skin in the game and I'm actually going through this process, which is very, very different from people standing around and saying, oh, yeah, you're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do that. And, I, you know, one of the things I always say to anybody about anything is I need to know if this person ever did this. Did they ever actually right. coach anybody or train anybody who did, in fact, accomplish something along these lines? Because I had kids. It's funny. I'm going to China next week. And one of the things, one of the slides that I put in was a couple of my guys who are 32 years old who started with me at 12 years old. And they're in like their eighth and ninth year in the NHL. But they started with us at 12. And so I've seen this process. I've seen what actually happens versus what everybody tells you happens. And and I guess what really made me do it was I get so angry at people who are giving parents false information. They're, they're telling parents lies because it benefits them. They're telling parents, oh, your kid needs to play one sport. Your kid needs to specialize. You know, if your kid doesn't do this, he'll get left behind. And I'm looking at this saying, that is not true. I have not seen that from an evidentiary standpoint in my career. I have not seen kids who played multiple sports get left behind. I've seen kids who played multiple sports actually excel. And that I, you know, you talk about my daughter, but I used my I used to say to people all the time, well, my daughter's either going to be a failed science experiment or something good's going to happen. And I show people to picture her all the time with the national championship trophy over her head. I mean, she had a full scholarship at 15 years old to go to college, you know, to, to a division one school that's won three of the last five women's national championships wow. in ice hockey. And she was playing U14 soccer right up until like her first visit, her first campus visit, she was still 14 years old. It was right before her 15th birthday. And that spring, she played her last year of, of U14 soccer because she was still eligible. And in U14 soccer, she was the best goalie and the best forward. And they literally would move her depending on what the score was. If they were losing, she came out of the net and played forward. If they were winning, she went from playing forward to being in the goal. That's how good an athlete she was in soccer. Right. Which, you know, she won the state championship in judo. She won our summer league, you know, uh, swimming and diving thing. She became the diver. She was like, one year she became the U12 diver because she'd be throwing herself off the diving board and doing cartwheels and doing flips. And the guy was like, I need a diver. And she was like, oh, I can do that. So I just haven't seen this idea, you know, because people always, and even if she started skating late, she started skating, I think, late, theoretically, seven before she even got on the ice and people would say stuff like Eric Cressy posted a thing the other day where some uh, high school or, you know, uh, some like middle school baseball coach told someone, or oh, your kid will never be able to play in high school because he didn't start till he was eight years old. And, you know, and I said, the guy is a loser and a moron because you just can't do that. Like I could have taken you at 12 and probably made you, I could have said, okay, let's pick a sport. And I still probably could have got you to play in high school and in college no matter what that was. And obviously you were on the high end of the athletic spectrum, but the kids that are on the lower end actually benefit. I always said, you know, you get into like, oh, people, you need your 10,000 hours. And I'm like, yeah, but your 10,000 hours towards hockey includes soccer. It includes lacrosse. It includes all this right. stuff because right. you're developing like your kids. I mean, your kids ran track, right? You got yep. one that plays basketball. You got one that played football at Notre yep. Dame. And, you know, it wasn't like, you know, you were in elite seven on seven when he was seven years old. Right. And telling people, you know, no, that's all he's doing. You know, he's just, he, all he does is uh, he does seven on seven, you know, in the off season. And then he does football and like seven on seven has actually managed to screw up football. No question. The only sport that wasn't year round, they're trying to make year round, at least for the skill guys with these stupid seven on seven leagues. And I've been reading a lot. I don't know if you know Tony Hall, but I've been reading a lot of Tony Hall stuff. And one of the things that Tony talks about all the time is how now, a lot more of the high school coaches, particularly with the skill position guys, are looking for kids to run track because they want times. You know, they want to know what's this kid, you know, what's he run the 100 in? What's he run the 55 in? Because it's a lot easier than trying to watch film and say, oh, yeah. Right. It's one thing I always said, looking fast and being fast aren't the same thing. No doubt. You know, you see some kids like I, our fastest guy, our fastest hockey guy is our worst runner. But he's got a 37-inch vertical jump and he's running a 104 flying 10, you know, with only a 10 yard lead up. If we gave him 15 yards, he'd be sub one Oh, wow. He weighs about 215 pounds, but he doesn't look real pretty doing it. Yeah. 
Now, Mike, what do you think is driving that? What do you think is driving? Um, money. I think money always yeah. drives it. Money drives it. And what ends up happening, so even you, you're younger than me, but when we were young, you had teacher coaches, yep. people that were in the schools. Now we've got entrepreneur coaches. So if I'm a soccer guy, I need year round soccer. If I'm a hockey guy, I need year round hockey because I got to make my living with the same sport year round. And so as a result, they just start to tell people lies like, oh yeah, you got to commit year, you got to commit to year round. And then they'll throw out something like, Oh, that's what the Brazilians do in soccer. And I kind of look at it and think, that's what they do in soccer because that's all there is. Right. That's not a choice. It's a necessity in certain places. And people say, oh, you know, the Canadians, that's all they do is play hockey. And I'm like, that's not true. I have Canadian friends that, that played that are in the Hockey Hall of Fame. Uh, you know, Cam Neely was a great basketball player, loved basketball. Brandon Shanahan is like a box lacrosse legend in Canada. And you're kind of like, it's still not true and it's never been true. That's what drives in. And this, uh, you know, I talk about that in the presentation, I mean, Christine Lilly, arguably one of the greatest women's soccer players in history. She was captain of three sports in high school. You know what I mean? She captained the soccer team, she captained the basketball team. And I think she captained the softball team. And as I said, I look at this stuff and think there's more examples of that. Nomar, I always go back. Nomar Garcia Parr. Nomar loves soccer, loves it. And he told me what time he said, man, if, you know, if if we had the Premier League in the U.S. and I could uh, I could make money, he said I'd be I'd be um, playing soccer. I wouldn't be playing baseball. Yeah. And then he told me he went to Georgia Tech and he tried to walk on as a kicker because he could kick a soccer ball. He's like, yeah, I tried to walk on as a kicker, but the the baseball coaches wouldn't let me do it. And you know, and this guy was in college already, talking about you know playing soccer and kicking a football and so just crazy. I could go on forever. So now on the flip side of it, and. I, I've had the great fortune of working under Mike Boyle, visiting Charlie Francis, spent the week with him, Dan Paff, Mike Wojcik, who, as you know, I got a great relationship with him. He recruited me when he was at Syracuse, and I've been tight with him ever since. All these people I've worked under. Brett McFarlane, when I was coaching at Penn State, I worked three or four of his track camps. So I was the demo. I was a young guy. I was demoing everything, right? I say all this because... Have you, on the flip side of it, as a coach, have you noticed that there's been this trend toward complexity in terms of teaching and disseminating knowledge to the athlete? Oh, yeah. I think it's funny you, you say it because I'm going down to talk at Altus in October. And in some ways, I'm almost afraid because I'm going to be like, they're going to think I'm a simpleton. Because right. I'm going to show them what I do and I'm going to tell them what I believe. And I think some of the people are going to look at me and be like, yeah, but what else? And I'm going to be like, no, there really isn't anything else. Like, this is what we do. This is what we've always done. And we've had, and I look at it, I mean, we had off the charts success with our athletes, with our programs, with all of these things. And I just don't think it's complex. I think it's pretty darn simple. It's not, and the one thing, and well, I, I will go back. There's one thing I think that we did miss the boat on a little bit and Track didn't miss the boat on it, but they didn't by accident, you know, because the one thing I didn't realize was that we don't run fast enough. And in track, that's never been a problem. Right. But in every other sport, like, and we always ran sprints. I always said, we always sprinted. We have always sprinted in our programs. Always, 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 you know, all kinds of Vern Gambetta drills, you know, lean fall runs and ball drops and, you know, falling starts. But the one thing that we didn't do, and this is why I, I give Tony Holler all the credit in the world for me, is what, what I would do with a guy, I'd say, if you do what I want you to do, you'll get faster. And then I might time you in September and in May and be able to point and say, see, I was right. But I would never have timed you in between. And so now we've gone, we, we time either tens or flying tens every week. Right. Twice a week. Because I think, and this is, and I, this is what I was saying about with the Altus presentation, one of the things that I did is I, I pulled up a picture of um, Carl Lewis and Ben Johnson. And one of the things that was very clear to me was that both of these guys had amazingly similar results with amazingly dissimilar body types and dissimilar training programs. But the common thread in both training programs 
running sprints. Mm. And that's why sometimes you look at bolts. I look at bolts training videos, you know, his weight training program. And I'm like, Oh my God, that looks like worse than what we did in the eighties. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But he runs sprints and he runs fast. And sometimes I think maybe the most underrated thing that we either do or don't do is just the plain art of running fast. Right. Not even art. Cause I don't even know if it's art. I mean, you know, it is when you're really good at it and it, it's maybe not, it can be a little bit ugly when you're not, when you're not good at it, but it still ends up being really important. I could totally concur with you. I, I think the simplicity, when I went to visit Charlie Francis, I spent a week with him. I was with the 49ers. I got up in the morning. We went to York College. And he wanted me to feel what a massage felt like, right? An invigorating massage before you, before you train. So he'd get me on the table. I'd go through that. Then we would go through a warm-up. Then we had a sprint day. And as you know, he's got his high-low concept. So when we did high intensity, we sprinted. We ran 10s, 20s, 30s. Well, his coaching cues, he said very, very little. Very little. He emphasized key things, key aspects about foot strike, recovery mechanics, just really simple stuff. I was with this guy for seven days. And what I left, I'm thinking, wow, that was, that was brilliantly simple. And I think that just in having coached so many athletes and having worked with so many different people, I think the s- simplicity wins when we're trying to convey that to athletes. What is your thought on that? Oh, I, I don't think there's any question. That's why you, know, you go back to this complete youth training program. The big criticism of the program that I put out was that it was too simple. Because mm. what I literally said was, hey, here's what we're going to do with kids. We're going to jump, throw, sprint. So we're going to throw med balls. We're going to do basic plyos. We're going to run short sprints. And then we're going to lift, and we're basically going to do hand clean, goblet squat, bench press, chin up, and we're going to learn to do some kind of one leg straight leg deadlift. And I was like, that's it. And people were like, that's it? You know, what about core training? What about this? I'm like, no. When you're talking about 11, 12-year-old kids, man, it does not have to be complicated at all. They, And I go back. I always use the education analogy. I always said, when you go to school, you need to learn reading and you need to learn writing and you need to learn arithmetic. It is not complex. You just, you got to be able to read. You got to be able to write complete sentences. You got to know your math facts. And no one looks at you in second grade and says, Mike, what about calculus? What about algebra? What, what about when are we going to get to geometry? Because in education, we know that these things build on themselves. We don't know that in sports training. We're in such a big hurry to sort of give calculus to our 12-year-old that we can't see that and think, no, that that kid's not ready for that. And it's not even necessary. You, right. know, you look at most of these, and it was funny. I go back, like Eric Cressy had a great post the other day, too, about he was saying that you know we do soft tissue work and warm up and all this stuff with our younger kids. He said, even though they probably don't need it, we want to create habits. We want to ingrain habits. And I thought, that's exactly how we are. We start out, it's like, I want them to understand, hey, we need to do soft tissue work. We need to warm up. We need to do movement before we lift. But the reality is, we could just walk in there and lift weights like we did. Because think about it. When we, would, when we go back to Dwayne Carlisle and Billy Brooks and Calvin Hall in that weight room, there wasn't much warm up. We walked in the room, we started lifting weights. We, weren't, we were nowhere near. It's like all the other stuff is probably what's blossomed more than what we did in the weight room when you start thinking about what we were actually accomplishing. I don't yeah. know if we ever, <laughs> if we stretched, we did it outside before we ran and soft tissue work. We hadn't even thought about that yet. We were doing nothing and, you know, warm up, mobility, nothing, you know, warm up was 135. That was right. warm up. Right. <laughs> you know, and so, so I think you can kind of look at a lot of that stuff and in some ways think, oh, we've come a really long way. And then you can look at other stuff and think, nah, you know, we've, we've dressed up some of the, the, the start and the finish, but we haven't really changed the meat of what we do all that much. And that, you know, ultimately, you know, it's even with like unilateral training. I find most of the kids are not coordinated enough bilaterally in the beginning to benefit from unilateral training. They struggle, you know, learning. I want them to learn to squat. And then eventually we'll get to the split squat and to some of these other things. But right now it's, hey, can you get up and down? Can we improve your force production capability in the simplest possible way? 
so that we can get some benefit. Now, let's let's reverse engineer something here. You've, when we were talking at the Perform Better, you talked about how now you're training a third generation of athletes. And so you've worked with so many kids, like you mentioned 12 years old to you know, a guy that's 30 years old, you had him 18 years. What are some of the qualities that you've seen those elite, le- the ones that have reached the elite level have, and it's not necessarily just physical, but what are some of those qualities that you think differentiate them from you know, kids who don't get to that level? Uh, I can tell you one, in all honesty, is there is some mentor influence. And I was talking to one of our guys who uh, was a, a number two overall pick in the NHL a couple years ago. And he was talking about how my, he was like, my dad was hard on me. You know, you know, I'd come home some days and he, you know, he'd give me a hard time if I hadn't shot pucks. And I'm like, I was hard on my kids. You know, you were probably hard on your kids. I think there is some element. Now, you don't have to be crazy. You don't have to be delusional. You don't have to be unrealistic. But you need to teach your kids about work and that there's a result. You, know, you can't have the result without the work. No doubt. It doesn't, work, it doesn't work that way. And there's so many people... Everybody, you know, I always think parents, and that was one of the things I talked about in the in the in the lecture part of the program. Parents are always trying to like the helicopter parent. They're always trying to grease the skids. I want to get my kid on a better team. I want to do this. I want to do that. It's like, like yeah, maybe let your kid play. Well, I I always said with my daughter, she was not on very good teams growing up, and people would always be like, oh, why don't you send her here? Why don't you send her there? You know, that team wins all the time. And I'm like, because that's not really what I want. You know, you want some adversity in your kid's life. You want you want a kid that understands adversity, a kid that understands. I tell my son this all the time because my son is a late he's a December birthday. So in all like hockey is a birth year sport. And we always say if he was eight years older, he's freaking Wayne Gretzky. Or eight days older rather. You know, like he's the top kid in his group. Right. He's eight days younger, he struggles. He's not the top kid in his group because at that age, at 12, 13, 14, that year makes a really, really big difference. And it's like, hey, you know, you, you got to learn. This is the way that it works. You know, he always, I always say to him, you know, you can't change when you're born. <laughs> right. So you just got to learn to work harder. And you've got, I tell him all the time, you will work your way past a couple of kids every year. Yep. Every year, there'll be kids who aren't in the weight room. Every year, there'll be kids that aren't running sprints. Every year, there'll be kids that aren't, you know, shooting pucks or shooting lacrosse balls or kids that aren't doing what you're doing. And I've seen it, as you said, because I do have multiple generations of these kids. I've seen kids. One of my friend's sons, and I can remember this. Now, he's going to be a senior in high school. And as a senior in high school, he'll, he'll play on the varsity hockey team, and he'll be the starting catcher on the baseball team. I can remember his parents saying to me, it'll probably be over for him in ninth grade. <laughs> he just isn't going to be. You know, he's not that good an athlete. But they were always really supportive. Hey, he really you know, he, he loves to work. You know, We're going to get him in a skating program. We're going to get him to do this. We're going to get him to do that. I watched this kid work his way past his peers over a three-year period to the point where he's getting recruited for baseball in college. Right. And six years ago, when we were looking at this kid in sixth grade, you would have literally said, okay, there's no chance that this kid will play a college sport in anything. But but I see it. And I used to, with, I can remember with my daughter, you know, at, at 12 years old, people were like, oh, this girl's better or that girl's better, you know. 13 years old, you know, well, there's still one girl that's better in your age group, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then eventually, you know, by the time she's 14, it's like, ah, you know, she's 14. She's playing, you know, with 19 year olds. Now nah, there really aren't very many kids her age that are better than her, you know, and, and you just, but it was like that same incremental, you know, she's in the weight room at 11. Right. You know, doing cleans and pushing sleds and running. Sprints. Right. And these other kids are whatever, you know, buying ice cream and, you know, whatever, sitting in their backyard by the pool. So I, I think that's the one thing that I think is the common denominator with the kids who make it in the long run or just incredible high talent. Cause that's the other thing that I think frustrates people is you'll see some kids and think, Hey, that kid doesn't do shit, but he's the best one. And you're like, yep. And he might be the best one right to the end. Right. Who knows? But that's one of those things that you can't, you can't change that part. So to me, you can't worry about that part. It's their gifting. Yeah. And there are kids, I mean, you know, you, we can get into the whole sort of the whole genetics thing, you know, talent code and talent is overrated and all these books that were written about it. But 
the reality is there are genetically gifted kids and generally they come from genetically gifted parents. <laughs> right. Mike, let me ask you this on the, on the speed side, when we're talking kids need to sprint, they need to sprint, right? You go on Instagram and how many different ways and different drills do people have out there? I, I think I've once heard you refer to it as exertainment. And when you're a youth, what are the fundamental fundamental movement skills you need to develop? Yeah, in all honesty, sprinting. Yep. Run from A to B. Run from A to B fast. It's fat because a lot of times, I mean, the one thing you realize is this is something that sort of um, takes care of itself. And I'll watch people sometimes, and I used to think, and it was funny. Uh, do you, were you there with Tony Winston? Do you remember that name, Smurf? He was a little football player. Oh, but yeah, he, yeah, yeah. Tony Winston. Kentucky? Was he from Kentucky? Kentucky? Yep, he was from Kentucky. Yeah. He would run really fast. And I remember every time we watched him, the coach would say stuff like, he crosses his arms across his body or his legs go different directions. And I'm like, he's the fastest kid. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I'm like, I understand, like, that – there may be a way that somebody said you're supposed to do this, but he's gotten really efficient at doing this and he can do it faster than everybody else. And sometimes I, you know, again, particularly for non track and field athletes, I'm very non mechanical. I, I, cause I've watched way too many guys. And I say, this is one of my big criticisms of track. You'd watch some guys and think, man, that guy runs really pretty. Like, that's beautiful. Watch him warm up, watch him run, watch his arms, watch his legs, but he's not very fast. Right. Because you take that guy in the weight room and he's in there doing squats with 135 and he's cleaning 95 pounds. And, you know, he's got a, you know, he's a sprinter with a 29 inch vertical. And you're like, hey, you know something? You're not going to go very fast. You're going to look really good doing it. Right. And you're going to be the guy, they're going to move you up. Because they're going to be like, well, if we just move him up, if we make yeah, him run yeah, the yeah. quarter, yeah, he'll be okay. And then eventually you won't be that good at the quarter. And all of a sudden they'll decide like, you know, you're going to run the 800 meters. And, you know, eventually you're pretty running and the combination of that and hard work will, will kind of yield some benefit, but the pure, you know, that guy who can run the 55, that guy that can run the hundred, that kind of thing, that guy can put, you know, I never go back like the Peter way and stuff. He actually came out to our facility when we were in, uh, um, Burlington, you know, and talked to us and it was just like, you know, something, the guys who run the fastest put the most force into the ground. Yeah. There's a reason the fastest guy at the NFL combine generally has a 40 inch vertical jump. Right. It's cause there's a pretty direct correlation to your ability to put force into the ground and your ability to move across the ground. Yeah. And not perfect correlation, but pretty darn strong. Like you won't see, you're not going to see a guy run a four, three with a 30 inch vertical jump mm -hmm. unless he is a gifted, gifted runner. So I think, you know, so we've always kind of kept it basic. Hey, keep working, keep getting stronger, keep trying to increase your vertical, keep, you know, trying to lower your 10, like, you know, try to, you know, it's like the Charlie's high, low idea. Hey, every week we're going to have some highs. We're going to try to jump as high as we can. We're going to try to run as fast as we can. And right. we're going to then the, and the thing with the weightlifting is you can't do that in, in lifting because you get hurt, but you can do that in jumping and sprinting, particularly if it's done intelligently. Like for us, that's why I said, we, we don't go, you know, Tony and I keep going back to Tony Hall stuff, but Tony had some great ideas. He said stuff like basically flying 10 is going to be your best measure of pure speed. You want to be running flying 10s. Okay. So we did that. And, you know, and then he said, and don't run them against anybody else. You only run against yourself. He said, we only compete. He said, we compete on Saturdays, not during the rest of the week. He said, during the rest of the week, we compete against ourselves. And we've had, and I, I will knock on wood and say, we've had no problems from an injury standpoint. We don't stretch it out. Even our, our fly 10, you know, we're giving them a 10 meter run up. So we basically 20, we don't really go beyond 20, you know, we're still keeping it safe, but we're doing simple things. Well, right. Mark Ray Blatt, he was doing that with us back in the eighties. Imagine that's something. Yeah. Think about doing, that. Yeah. He was doing that. Like there's, there's not, there's not too much I haven't seen. And I watch a lot of stuff and I keep my mouth shut cause I'm not trying to be that guy that's, you know, that, that's out there uh, up on a mountaintop. There isn't that much stuff in bounding. Bounding is now making a very popular comeback, right? And over the last 10 years, but bounding is something that's been prevalent in the industry for a long time in terms of developing rate of force development, single leg power, bilateral power, you name it. And 
I, I, it's interesting I, with this conversation. Well, with bounding, because my whole thing with bounding is that, um, you know, and this, I always go back. I have my criticisms of track people, but sure. I always say, you know, bounding, bounding looks good when you see track people. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it looks really <laughs> bad when you see non track people do it. And so it's funny, like for us, and this is another really smart kid, Cameron Joss, he's a kid you should try to get on sometime too. But Cameron Joss introduced me to like Matt Cross's stuff and JB Marin's stuff, sled sprinting stuff. And like I said, it's stuff that it's not stuff that hasn't been done before. Yeah. But Cam's really into power skipping. And I like power skipping better than bounding because it's a little less violent. It, you know, there's a little less problem when you take somebody who doesn't have great strength to body weight ratio and say, do you take someone with bad strength to body weight ratio? And I was, you know, I like bounding is a thing of beauty when you watch someone who can bound. And then it is an abomination when you watch someone who can't. Sure. And you just realize that, you know, the guy who can't probably never should do it. <laughs> yeah. Now, the power skip, I consider a power skip a form of a bound, yeah. right? And what, what I've seen, when you look at somebody doing a single leg movement, the way to absorb the force is to be active from the knee to the ankle, and you just see him drop, boom, and then that foot typically is in, way in front of their center of mass at ground contact, and that's, it, it's a scary thing, especially bigger guys. It's like, woo, yeah. stop. Just, when you're thinking about eight times body weight yeah. with bigger guys, like you get guys that are, you know, even 200 pounds, that's 1,600 pounds of force. Yeah, yeah. You get a guy that's 300 pounds, it's over a ton. Yeah. On that guy's SI joint, it, it, that's not gonna that's not gonna end well. Right. Because I can remember a year. I mean, I I heard Chris Doyle doing this one day. I heard Brent McFarland talk, and he was talking about multiple single leg hops for distance. That was gonna be the key, you know, to speed development. That guy who could cycle through, you know, just single like single leg bounding, really. You know, and the guy that can single leg bound is gonna be able to fly. And Chris wanted to get faster, and I never thought about the fact that Chris was you know six foot two seventy, <laughs> and I mean. We literally, he got about two bounds, <laughs> crumbled on the track and like hit his knee. You know what I mean? Like he hit his foot and he just couldn't stabilize himself and he hit his knee on the track. And I, and I was like, okay, this is a bad idea. But then the next day he came in and he had SI joint pain to beat the band. You know, he was like, man, my back. And like he literally at that point, like put his fingers on his SI joint, like right here. Yeah, yeah. And I kind of thought afterwards, I was like, man, am I, I always say, dude, boy, am I dumb. Boy, did that, you know, and this is where, you know, I always talk about square pegs, round holes and, you know, and knowing your audience and all this stuff, like when I, you know, all the standard things I talk about in my talks, but at that time I was just too dumb. And I, I just thought, okay, this is a really good idea. I can apply this idea to anybody. Right. right. And that's the problem with going from track to sports is that you track has a wonderful, naturally selected base of people. They're all there for a reason. <laughs> They either X, they can run and jump. That's why they're on the track team. You go to football or hockey or basketball or any of these schools, there are people who are naturally selected for another skill entirely. And they may not have, you know, you go back to like the Kevin Durant thing, you know, you can't bench 185 at the end at the NBA combine. He's pretty good at basketball though. You know, and you kind of look and think all, all it proves is that obviously bench pressing does not, it's not indicative of success in basketball. And, and you think, you know, and then I remember Todd Wright showing a picture of his feet. You know, he's got these big flat feet. And you think, man, he wouldn't have been good at track. And he wouldn't have been good at football. And he's not good at weightlifting. But damn, he's really good at basketball. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and, you know, you just got to, it's like, you have to get a sense of your audience. And I think that's what we don't do well in strength and conditioning is we're always, it's like, we beat the square peg into the round hole and we beat it hard because we have a way we want to do everything, you know, everything is squat, bench, and, you know, back squat, bench press, power clean. And you're like, well, you may not have the audience for that particular program. Right. And you may need to rethink it. All right, Mike, let's, let's close with this. Being the parent that you are, now it's strictly parent lens. What are the three things that you put your stamp on that you need to do. These are three absolutes that you need to do for your developing athlete to help them be successful. You need to teach them about work. You need to teach them about the cause and effect of work. You need to, one of the things that I'm very proud of, my, my kids like to go to practice. You know, you go back to the old Iverson quote, 
practice. We're talking about mother effing practice here, you know? Yeah. Like, don't let your kid become that, you know, kid who <laughs> skips practices and shows up for the games. Like, oh, I didn't, go, I didn't go to practice, you know? Because there are parents who do that. They get the kids on two or three teams, and the kid just shows up for the games and never, shows, never goes to practice. I was adamant with my kids about, you go to practice, to the point, like, my daughter would go, and she'd stay for two practices. She'd be like, yeah, I'm going to do the, you know, the U14 skill session. I'm going to stay with the U16s, and I'm going to do theirs after we do ours. And I'd be like, cool, that's great. You know, so I think that's the number one thing. Um, you know, I think respect, you know, learning. I'm, I'm adamant with my kids about, I, I had to talk with my son yesterday. You know, he wasn't as attentive. Someone was trying to talk to him, and he was distracted. And he didn't look the person in the face, and he wasn't answering their questions. And I was like, you can't do that. Right. You know, this is a, it was a friend of mine, a person that he knows well. I said, you can't treat that person that way. And he didn't mean it. It wasn't intended to be disrespectful, but it was. And so, and, and the one thing you realize, so if you look at, you know, these two things, you know, practice and then respect, right? And then school, because the reality is you may not get a scholarship. That, I mean, the, the statistics on scholarships tell you you're way better spending your money off spending your money on a tutor than you are in a sports program because you've got a much higher probability of getting academic aid than you do athletic aid but if you can combine both you become very attractive to some of the best schools in the world mm -hmm. and if you're like you know you're you know if your son's a real good student and he can play football you know, he can go to stanford he can go to vanderbilt for free you know, he can go to Harvard, he can go to Yale, he can go to Princeton, you know what I mean? You know, and there are eight financial aid schools, but you have a world of opportunity. I see kids all the time who they, all the eggs go in the, the athletic basket and then suddenly they're crappy students and they realize, wow, I don't have any choices here because the division two, you know, I didn't, I'm not a division one kid. And, you know, now all of a sudden I can't go to Bates. I can't go to Bowdoin. I can't go to Colbert. I can't go to Middlebury. I can't go to Amherst. I can't go to Williams because I didn't study. So now I have to go to, you know, to some far lesser academic school and take my, you know, my athletic talents, quote unquote, to that school, as opposed to getting a ridiculously good education because of my ability to play sports. So I think really those are, I mean, you know, teach your kid to, to practice, teach your kid to be respectful, make your kid do his schoolwork. And then I'll be honest with you, the rest of it, the rest of it's going to take care of itself. And you know, because you did it. That's how your, your kids are. They're great. They're great students. I, I get credit to your wife. I have no, to be honest. Mom, no, right? I, mar I married and way up. They're, they're great young men. They're polite. They're respectful. They don't get in trouble, right? And yep. they go in, They get into good schools. And that's what I mean about people not. I look at people and think, when you're going to tell me that you know how to do this, I'm like, then show me your kids. <laughs> you know, show me your results. Show me something that establishes for me that you actually got this figured out. Like I can look at somebody and say, I think I have this figured out. You know, I mean, now and I'm only one for one. I don't know. You know, I got another one along, come along the line, but you know, with, with my younger one, I said, he's, he's talented and he's good in school. So he's, you know, and he's polite and he's respectful right now. He's three for three for me. And I do believe that, you know, five years down the line when he's 18, that's going to pan out. It's a little hard to predict with boys, but we shall see. Right. And I make them run sprints. <laughs> All day, right? Yeah. <laughs> Got to be fast in every sport. Well, Mike, I want to just thank you for the time. Uh, this is, it's an honor. You've always, I've said this to you every time I see you, you've always supported everything I've done from my camp way back at my high school to, to this show. I, I can't thank you enough. I can't well, you know, you. I will continue to do that. Like, I'm so, I am so proud of my guys. Like, I brag all the time. You know, like these are my guys. These are guys that I coached. You know, when they were kids. Yeah. And it's the same thing. It's no different than my, you know, guys like you and Chris Doyle and people like that that I look at and think I coached these guys in college. Yeah. And now they're, you know, they're in my profession, succeeding. I mean, I don't think as a coach, I don't know if you can be more proud than that except of your own kids you know what i mean to see somebody mm -hmm. that you coach that's ex, you know that's exceeded your expectations in a field that you sort of introduced them to i think it's probably the greatest compliment that you get in coaching well mike how can people get in contact with that i, I know but just in case this just you know, in the case one thing, if you want to talk yeah. every day strengthcoach.com is sort of you know and it's a paid website it's 15 bucks a month i always look at people and say if you can't pay 15 bucks a month 
to get every question you want answered, then you're not very smart. And that's the best place. The, the um, complete youth training that we talked about is available from Athletes Acceleration. If you go to Athletes Acceleration or if you just type in complete youth training, Pat Beath, who runs that stuff, does a great job of making it really easy to find on the internet. So that stuff is there. You know, I'm on Twitter, M Boyle1959. I'm on Facebook, which is easy to find. I just put in Michael Boyle, it pops up. I'm on Instagram, oh. Michael underscore Boyle1959. Yeah, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm getting pretty modern here. Tonight, you know? so, <laughs> I've got it. I, I'm I'm out there in the social media channels, and so there's lots of opportunities if people want to learn, want to connect. All right. Well, thanks for the time, and greatly appreciate you. And you know, I'll be in touch. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great insight by Mike Boyle. I expected nothing less. Mike shared some great, great, great things with us. I'm gonna start with this. Here's an awesome takeaway. He talked about the common denominator amongst all the athletes that he trained when they were younger, they stayed with them through their career, they ascended to the pro level, and he said the common denominator amongst them all was that they worked hard. There's no substitute for hard work. We hear it all the time. There's all these different slogans and sayings and so forth, but that's the first thing that grabbed Mike Boyle was that they work hard. I asked Mike, give me the three things that a parent should know and emphasize with their young athlete. He said, one, work hard. Two, be respectful. And three, do well in school. He shared stories as a dad raising athletic children. He's got a 13-year-old son, Mark. He's got Michaela, who's a freshman in college, who actually was on the national championship hockey team this past year. And how Michaela... He's a multi-sport athlete. Mark plays lacrosse and he plays ice hockey. He's a big proponent of the multi-sport model. He also believes that athletes should sprint. Teach them how to sprint and sprint often. That if you do those things, that an athlete inevitably is gonna have a higher ceiling because you've taught and imparted those skills at such a young age. The takeaways were immense. And this is it. This is a podcast I'm going to go through time and time again. Whether this is your first time you've listened or if you've listened to every episode, I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you like what you've heard, please share it with a friend. Our goal is to impart knowledge to parents to help them to support their athletic children. If you're listening on the Apple Podcast app, it's super easy to share. Just tap on the three dots in the bottom right hand corner. And an option will appear that says share episode. You can text a friend the episode right there. It's super simple. We appreciate that. And if you do that, thank you. To find out more about programs to help your child improve their speed, quickness, and agility, visit carlileperformance.com to register for an upcoming program to help your child get better. In the meantime, in between time, have a blessed day.